and welcome to this justice event, uh, Barriers and Threats to Access to Justice in the Immigration and Asylum System. My name is Ellen Lefley, I'm one of the lawyers at Justice. And this event is the second in a new series of justice events where we are going to be looking at areas of the justice system which have been a focus for our previous working parties and looking at some of the impact of our recommendations, as well as looking forward to ongoing challenges in those areas. Some of you, if you're not members of justice, just a little bit of background. We are an all party law reform and human rights charity. We work to strengthen the justice system, make it more accessible, fairer and more efficient across the United Kingdom. Uh, we are a membership organisation and our membership is available to all those who work in the legal profession and those who are outsiders to it in terms of their professional lives, but very much interested and want to be involved in working towards our charitable goals with us. Uh, our working parties and events like this are only made possible because of the support of our membership. So to all those membership members in the audience today, uh, welcome and thank you. Before we get started, uh, just a small amount of housekeeping to cover. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session at the end of um, this event. We're hoping to be able to have uh, 20, 25 minutes of, of questions. So the questions for that, please put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, and we will try to answer what we can. For any technical issues or for any commentary which isn't a question, uh, please feel free to use the chat box um, and please do so respectfully. And we will be recording the webinar, but we will be excluding the Q&A section. Uh, I'll now introduce our chair, um, who for justice members, I'm sure needs no introduction. Sonali Nayak QC is a senior public law and immigration practitioner with over 29 years experience, who specializes in public law cases and in all aspects of immigration, asylum and nationality law. She has a very substantial immigration and asylum experience in her high court and appellate court practice and extensive judicial review practice in the areas of Article 8 ECHR certification, nationality, challenges to Home Office policy, trafficking and unlawful detention. Sonali is the Chair of Liberty, a trustee of Freedom from Torture and the Immigrant Aid Trust, the charitable arm of the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. She was on the 2018 Justice Working Group, Immigration and Asylum Appeals, A Fresh Look, and remains a member of the Justice Council. Um, Sonali, over to you. Thank you very much, Ellen. That's a really nice introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Ellen uh, today as well, who's going to give us a little update on the report that we did in 2018, also with us on that uh, working party that was chaired by Sir Ross Cranston, was uh, Jawed Lakman, who I'm going to introduce in, you to in a moment. But is it appropriate, Ellen, to get, for you to do the update on the report first, and then I can come to the panel in, in, in due course? Absolutely, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, well, I the the idea of, of this section, which won't be too long, is to have that look back and turn back at the 2018 report, which, as Sonali has just said, was chaired by Sir Ross Cranston and um, sought to make the, uh, with its recommendations, sought to recommend how the immigration and asylum appeals process through the courts and tribunals uh, could be fairer, more accessible and, and more efficient. Um, and the idea is to look back at some of the implementation of those 49 recommendations that was made that were made in that report now before we look forward to the Nationality and Borders Bill for the remainder of the event. So I thought I'd first touch on the online tribunal process and the process that was on the cusp of being created and piloted when the working party met over 2017 and 18. The working party saw the potential of digitization of moving the appeal process within the first tier tribunal online as um, providing real potential rather than just creating digital versions of the paper processes, it could contribute towards an innovative process which would improve efficiency as well as improving the experience for litigants and the quality of the outcomes. The key elements of the justice recommendations about how that could happen within the online process were that the work should be more front loaded, 
Now, this was both an onus on the Home Office to upload documents, and it was also in terms of the appellant skeleton argument, that being a front loading of the work and the nature of the appeal and the points to be made um, before it came to a tribunal hearing. That then rolled into the mandatory reconsideration stage. That was a key recommendation of the justice report, not the first people to recommend it, of course, but a key recommendation of what justice thought could be a linchpin of an improved, more efficient process. That mand mandatory reconsideration stage being when the Home Office must consider and respond to the appellant skeleton argument and evidence before any tribunal hearing was listed. In terms of how this has been implemented, that mandatory reconsideration stage was included within the online appeal pilot process, which was in private beta in 2019, and then became uh, public uh, as a pilot process and later rolled out ahead of plan during 2020 due to the pandemic. The pre-reform withdrawal rate um, for the Home Office at this mandatory reconsideration point, so withdrawing to grant the relief that was being appealed, the pre-reform withdrawal rate was 13% of all cases. That was, the that was the annual average in 2017 and 18. While the pilot was in private beta, the rate increased, and now the average withdrawal rate across 2021 is 26%. Now, Justice cautiously marks this as a success. A significant number of appellants have been stressed, that 26% have been spared stressful and unnecessary appeals. However, it must be stated that we are not looking back at a normal year, indeed not a, not a normal two years. This figure does incorporate abnormal, with, abnormal withdrawal rates across the height of the pandemic, which can't fully be attributed to the pilot processes. On reflection, it's clear to see, to, to see that there are two things, however, that are essential to this mandatory reconsideration stage delivering its potential in the future when we become hopefully clear of the pandemic. The first is efficiency of those initial steps being inextricably linked with the quality of the work. So that work, the appellant skeleton argument, has to be adequately funded. And furthermore, increases in the number of cases being dealt with by the Home Office to review the teams needs to be given adequate funding also. There also needs to be a system of proper and effective feedback so that errors in initial decision making can be rectified if they are identified to be um, matters of pattern and can, can create systemic improvement. Indeed, getting the decision right first time was identified as a way of improving efficiency downstream and making better initial decisions is a key output of what a proper and effective feedback mechanism from a mandatory reconsideration team could be. We're informed that the Home Office do have a making better decisions board which does identify patterns. And it's important, of course, that the outcome of that making better decision board consideration of what is being withdrawn to grant within that mandatory re reconsideration stage is um, put into effect. I also wanted to touch on that rollout ahead of schedule that happened um, last year in relation to the pandemic. That caused various unexpected consequences. It certainly meant that the Justice Working Party's recommendation of slow and careful evaluation of digitization and of video hearings was frustrated. Justice responded to the pandemic. Sorry, I've just knocked something off my desk. Justice responded to the pandemic um, by uh, across the justice system. And some of you may have seen our innovative and first in the world fully remote jury trial, which we which we conducted last year. And the insights of that we sought to ensure the implications of those were, were communicated across the whole justice system. But specific to the immigration and asylum chamber, we considered how the participation of lay people could be and should be enhanced in video hearings and held meetings with HMCTS and the tech experts who helped us make the jury trial happen, particularly discussing how conference rooms and interpretation could work virtually. 
We also developed a script of an introductory video with assistance of some of the working party members and having conversations with people such as the Bail Observation Project and the Refugee Council. This resulted in a successful meeting with HMCTS on our script and their, their resulting introductory video and written guidance included many of our suggestions about how to make video hearings more accessible, uh, with the final product actually extending out to cover civil family and tribunal hearing introductory uh, introductions. Uh, and finally, specifically to assist appellants and claimants in the immigration and asylum tribunals, we persuaded HMCTS to update the who's who's the who's who poster that they have, and I'll put a link to um, this updated poster with ref that, that we updated uh, co-design between Justice and HMCTS. We updated to include video and telephone hearings, and that's now part of the Immigration and Asylum Chamber user guide. In relation to the uh, appellant in person um, online process, um, that has now begun, that began uh, for a limited number of appeals in August. Justice was involved in the stakeholder meetings for that service and that one and that service was of particular concern to the Justice Working Party that it should not be designed as a mirror image of the lawyer, uh, the represented online process, but that it should be designed for litigants in person and the most vulnerable litigants in person at that. Um, we will continue to work with HMCTS to, to identify issues as we continue to um, uh, co communicate with them and attend stakeholder meetings. Um, and we are pleased to see that the continued retention of a paper option, regardless, as recommended by the working party, uh, continues. We, the working party observed then and justice continues to observe now with its uh, digital exclusion work that the retention of a paper option is absolutely vital to ensure that the most digitally excluded people can still access justice. There are lots more updates on the online process, but in the interest of time, just to identify a couple more um, recommendations which have been implemented. Um, the, the Justice Working Party recommended that uh, minded to refuse letters from the Home Office should be uh, extended to all immigration cases, and that has been um, that has been picked up and is currently uh, happening and is showing positive results in terms of um, uh, communicating in human rights and family claims. Also a significant change is the recent confirmation that asylum operations within the Home Office have now started to allocate the case to a caseworker specialising a particular type of claim or country, uh, something that Justice recommended would be highly desirable to ensure accurate and informed decision making. That's something that was confirmed to us as of the 7th of June this year. Uh, in terms of tribunal procedure, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I did just want to flag that the justice report did consider that there would be a better way to do age assessments within the tribunal. I, I flag that because that has formed part of the um, Nationality and Borders Bill, and I'm not sure whether it will be discussed later, but I thought those uh, attending would be um, interested nevertheless. The, the working party did recommend that consideration should be given to um, age assessment judicial reviews um, being allocated not to the administrative court. Now, the justice report suggested that they be allocated to the upper tribunal, um, but of course the, uh, and suggested that there may be other forums such as the family court that may be um, well placed to hear age assessments. Given, the, the, given how small they were in number, but the disproportionate amount of, of, of time that they were taking up. Um, and of course, now that has, be, that has made its way into the Nationality and Borders Bill as a new appeal right um, after an age assessment decision. Um, and the, the current drafted uh, bill puts that in uh, the first tier tribunal. I'm, I'm going to stop there because I have a long list of, <laughs> of recommendations and what we've been doing, but um, I, 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 want to, I want to stop looking back and start looking forward. Um, but other areas that we made recommendations in, such as the, the quality of advice and representation and further details, particularly about the appellant in-person uh, pilot, 
um, that we've managed to glean through our ongoing stakeholder um, engagement um, will be will form part of an updated report um, which is due to come out early next year and um, uh, look forward to to sharing that and sharing the full fuller details um, with our membership and those and those wider um, but I'm going to stop talking now and um, hand over to our esteemed panel we'll hand over to to our chair who's going to introduce our panel um, who can uh, look at barriers and threats to access to justice uh, in the Nationality and Borders Bill and continue the event. Thanks so much for your time and for listening. Thank you very much, Alan. That was a very helpful update. And just to remind people for uh, just in relation to the uh, Immigration and Asylum Appeals of Fresh Look, that report was done in 2018, as Ellen referenced. And there was a, a quite a detailed working party that went on for over a year, including observers from HMCTS and judicial observers, as well as um, significant participation for, and invitation for contributions from other members who were all listed and acknowledged in the report, some very senior judiciary and some important NGO and UNHCR personnel. So those recommendations and the summary that, of that report, which identified particular issues around quality of representation, exploitative representation, and also an inefficient uh, culture both in relation in, in the decision making process and the court process those were all things that were really highlighted by the court since then of course we've had as ellen identified a sort of need to roll out some of those things in the context of covid and th there'll be lots of observations as to how well or otherwise that worked but what we now know is irrespective of all those recommendations and that the lie of the land has changed so much since 2018 because what we now have is a very significant piece of legislation that is literally in parliament being debated at the, pretty much as we speak or at the moment in the nationality and borders bill and that does present very clear threats to justice and the context uh, and access to justice for asylum seekers and refugees and the context um that is really important for it to be considered is look at the numbers of asylum seekers that we have at present certainly when i started in practice the numbers were around a hundred thousand i am that was about 30 years ago but we're looking now at numbers around the 30,000 marks really important to remember that i know that figure's been repeated uh, in many uh, parliamentary contexts, but it's, it is important. Look at the grant rate. So we're looking at an initial grant rate of about 46%. It increases by 10 to 20% at least after judges have and tribunal judges have had their say. So the success rate for asylum seekers in 2020 was between 56 and 66%. It's really, that in my view is a, when we're talking about access to justice we are talking about something that is of critical importance and also to re remember that those people who do, who do not succeed in their protection claims does not mean that they are not credible claims there are plenty of legal reasons of course why people's claims don't make the necessary thresholds uh, for international protection um, and may be granted on other bases in any event which are not reflected in those figures so that's what I just wanted to introduce as the context. But in order to discuss some of the issues going forward from the bill, um, I wanted to introduce this very, uh, very esteemed panel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Adrian Berry, my colleague from Garden Court Chambers. Obviously, Adrian is a specialist in British nationality law, statelessness, immigration detention. He specifically advises on EU law and withdrawal agreement now in particular. He also has a uh, a very particular specialism in um, homelessness and housing so he has a broad range of public law skills in the context of uh, of migration he's also um, a now a patron of the immigration law practitioners association so welcome to adrian um, i'd like to introduce jarwade lukmani again partner at lukmani thompson practicing in immigration and public law he importantly was on the um, the Justice Working Party, but he's got many senior roles as in the past, as the Chief Assessor of the Law Society's Asylum Immigration Accreditation Scheme, Treasurer of ILPA, an external assessor for the Bar Direct Access Scheme, a panel, um, uh, a member of LA, the Legal Aid Practitioners Group, committee member, and he's on the Access to Justice Committee of the Law Society and the Advisory Committee of the LAPG. 
and Jarwed was appointed to the Council of the Law Society in October 21. So, and for the past 25 years, uh, at least, has written for the for the LAG um, magazine on immigration. So welcome, Jarwed. Um, next, I'll just turn to Alison Pickup, who's now the Director of Asylum Aid, uh, just re where she leads an expert team uh, providing legal representation to asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, as you probably know to many of you that before joining Asylum Aid just recently in November 21, before that Alison was the legal director at the Public Law Project and she led its work on access to justice issues in the new plan for immigration and on judicial review reform. So really uh, important contributions to come from Alison, thank you. And finally uh, for our panel, but not at all least, is Bella Sankey. Fantastic to see you, Bella. Director of um, Detention Action, it's a national charity that seeks to defend the rights and improve the welfare of people in immigration detention. Um, detention Action supports people detained in Harmonsworth, Colmbrook, Morton Hall, IRCs, as well as those held under immigration powers in prison. Um, the organisation successfully challenged the former detained fast track scheme uh, for asylum seekers, leading to its suspension by the Court of Appeal in 2015 and is involved in some important litigation at, as we speak, uh, which Bella's going to speak to a little bit later. Um, Bella was previously the Deputy Director of Reprieve and Director of Policy at Liberty, and she was called to the bar in 2008. So I welcome all of you, and I'm really glad to be able to start this conversation. Uh, that's how we've sort of structured this, this session, which is to have a sort of discussion about some of the broader issues, and then we'll invite questions, hopefully, if we get time for that. Sorry, there's just somebody put a message in the chat, so I'm just going to check. Um, so um, just I wanted to perhaps just kick off by sort of talking a bit more about what are the threats to to lawful initial decision making um, and how that's going to be affected by the bill um, in terms of the provisions for um, the you know the actual accessing asylum claims territorially uh, whether one, one can actually claim asylum in UK territorial waters and what are the, the consequences of the kind of maritime enforcement that we've seen at, very recently of course across our uh, media um, in terms of whether that is denying access to the refugee convention and I thought I'd just come first and talk to Adrian about that if I may. Um Yes, um, thank you. Um, the the um, what we're seeing um, with the Nationality and Borders Bill um, is an attempt to uh, effectively frustrate refugee convention claims um, being made on the territory of the UK itself. Um, the way it works is is as a system, firstly of criminalising arriving in the UK as opposed to entering into the UK. So the journey on the way to the UK. Um, can be criminalised. And then secondly, um, connected to that are a series of maritime enforcement powers which allow Home Office vessels to go beyond UK territorial waters um, into international waters and into uh, foreign waters on Home Office vessels and to board, stop, search and divert um, uh, the fragile vessels which are carrying people um, across uh, the English channels um, in order to seek uh, asylum. So, so, and the idea is that maritime enforcement is connected to the idea that you're preventing criminal offences. So first of all, you criminalise people, including asylum seekers, for arriving, for making the journey, and then you create a series of, if you like, enforcement powers. And in that pot um, is a provision in the Nationality and Borders Bill to say that you can't claim asylum in UK territorial waters because it's prohibited from being a designated place in which you can claim asylum. So when you put the package together, you have the ability for Home Office ships to go out into the channel beyond UK territorial waters, are they still perhaps even in the UK search and rescue area, beyond the UK search and rescue area into international waters where the French have an obligation to search and rescue and then into French waters um, themselves, um, and, and to push people back, literally, or, or, to, or, or to create the circumstances in which they cannot continue their journey. That creates not only a frustration um, to, because you can't claim asylum in the UK because either you can't get here um, or because um, you um, 
are diverted in UK territorial waters um, and that you can't claim asylum there. Um, but also um, it comes in the context of uh, Home Office uh, officials being immunised in the Nationality and uh, Borders Bill from civil and criminal liability for their actions um, as well, except in very narrow circumstances. Um, the effect um, is to frustrate the operation of a UK international law commitment, the Refugee Convention, um, and potentially the European Convention on Human Rights. I mentioned those purely because they're the ones that have uh, justiciability broadly domestically in one form or another. Um, there are other UK international commitments, of course, um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, which deals with the duty of rescue. Um, there, there was initially when the bill was introduced a requirement to have regard to that, which would have um, required the Secretary of State to sign off on operations, um, not only that they were compatible with, um, with navigation, but also with the duty of rescue. That's gone from the bill. The government possibly realised that that would make it justiciable. They took it out um, before the report stage. So taken together um, in the package, what you have um, is a series of measures that frustrate access to justice because they stop people um, claiming um, uh, refugee rights and potentially um, uh, limit the ambit of the Human Rights Act because there'll be debates about the limit of extraterritorial jurisdiction um, outside of UK territorial waters. Thank you, Adrian. That's, um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to speed through and say I'm not going to necessarily come back to others to comment unless they want to, but of course we will have some questions later. But those, I understand, are very, very important issues. Um, obviously, there may be litigation in relation to many of the things that we are discussing today in most in the broadest terms, um, and there may be obviously still contributions that may be made in Parliament in respect of those. Um, one of the other provisions is relates to the sort of the standard of proof how you actually make good a refugee claim, and I wondered, Alison, if you had any thoughts uh, about about that. Yeah, thanks, Nolly. I mean, I think you know, as Adrian said. The first thing is to stop people from getting here then the next thing is to make it really hard to prove your case or much harder to prove your case if you do manage to get into the asylum system and I think the provisions in the bill on this need to be seen in the context in in their whole context of what's in the bill and everything else that's going on because um, people trying to prove an asylum claim in this context are likely to be in accommodation centres in quasi detention or in actual detention um, we'll come on to talk later about the, the proposals for new detained fast track and so on so all of that taken together um, but what I was specifically sort of mentioned here is two aspects of the bill one is the part that changes the standard of proof for establishing a refugee convention claim and basically in, in raises the standard of proof for some, certain elements of the claim. So obviously designed to make it less likely that people will prove their claim to refugee status. Secondly, there's a series of provisions in the bill, the purpose of which is to um, try and encourage or force people to bring forward their claims at an earlier stage and penalizing them for failing to do so. And I think what underpins all of those provisions is an assumption that runs through the bill and run through the new plan for immigration policy paper and consultation that preceded it that anybody who's a genuine who has a genuine claim to make will make it at the first available opportunity and if you make a late claim it's likely to be spurious or vexatious or abusive in some way and what that kind of assumption that underpins the bill fails to take into account is the very many other barriers there might be to someone raising a claim when they're first presented with a document by the Home Office telling them that they've got to put forward their claim. Um, so it, lack of understanding, lack of trust, fear, trauma, uh, lack of access to adequate legal advice and so on. But all of that is kind of swept aside in the bill. And what we have are these uh, various provisions demanding that you make your claim at the first opportunity. And then if you don't do so, directing decision makers to do two things, which I'm, I'm not sure how different they are, but the first is to treat your failure to raise those claims or put forward that evidence in the time scale that the Home Office gave you as damaging your credibility. And secondly, to require a decision maker to give any evidence or informational submissions that are put forward at a later point um, as having minimal weight. And so it's, the, the bill is, is trying to prescribe to decision makers that they have to adopt the same assumption that has been sort of embedded into the bill that anybody who doesn't immediately put forward their whole case and all their evidence is probably not worth believing. I think that's a very troubling pattern and one that we see throughout the bill and it has in some contexts more serious consequences than 
than the sort of credibility impacts, but we'll we'll talk about the priority removal notices, I think, a bit later. I mean, we've seen some sort of minimal weight uh, or credibility uh, statutory provisions in the past, for example, you know, in relation to failing to claim at the in, in, at the point of arrival and um, and the weight to be attached to that and how the courts have dealt with that. I wonder whether, is this likely to be something you think that the courts will ultimately have to resolve in terms of how you allow a person to make good an asylum claim on the one well, is accepted to be the lower standard of proof but yeah undoubtedly undoubtedly so i mean, I, mean that is, I think section 8 of the 2004 act one of the earlier attempts to dictate to courts how they should assess credibility um and the court of appeal said well we need to read that in light of the principle of, of independence of the judiciary and the importance of the of courts being able to make their own independent decisions and i think there will be similar um, issues arising in this i think it's also worth saying you know in my experience anyway tribunal judges probably do to some extent already take into account that if you've made a claim later on you need to give an explanation for why you didn't make that earlier um but what this is trying to do is kind of force them to start with the assumption that there's probably not a good reason for that rather than approaching it all in the round yes thank you i think that we just uh, again want to um maybe move on to another issue just because we have so many issues to cover um one of the sort of broader and overarching issues which i think i'm going to come to to you bella to talk about is um in a way not even getting into the asylum system as we have it in the uk but the idea of outsourcing decision making through offshore processing um i just wondered whether you wanted to have any observations about how that is compatible with our our obligations under the Refugee Convention and on how the bill sort of tries to deal with those. Thanks, Sonali. Um, this is a hugely important issue. This bill is obviously full of all sorts of tricks and wheezes to try and essentially close down the UK's asylum system. And it is easy to kind of get lost in the sheer horror um, of its clauses and schedules. But I think it's really important to keep a very close eye on what is currently clause 28 and schedule three though the Home Secretary's um, tabled around 80 amendments to the bill in the past few days, so I'm sure that clause number will soon be changed. But this is really quite an eye-watering, enabling power, and it gives the Secretary of State the right to remove any, potentially all, asylum seekers in the UK to a so-called safe third country. And it really is as open-ended um, and as comprehensive as that. There's no provision in the bill which would allow somebody who was removed under this power and then subsequently determined to be a refugee to be brought back to the UK. And case law would obviously still, existing case law would obviously still apply, which means if you are outside of the UK's jurisdiction, um, you can't be granted refugee status and, and brought here. Um, and so really what this is, is a complete outsourcing of the asylum system. It's clearly been inspired by the Dublin Three um, return system. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard on numerous occasions over the past few years, ministers coming out and trotting this line that people have to claim asylum in the first safe country they reach. That is of course completely untrue. Um, but imagine you know, basing such a sweeping clause on that fundamental, I would argue, willful misunderstanding of how international refugee protection works. Um, so it's based on, on, on Dublin. I think the government is hugely frustrated that in uh, leaving the European Union, uh, they're now no longer able to return people to the EU and they haven't been able to make such a deal. But what's really important um, to, to consider with this clause is that it's also explicitly based on Australia's offshore detention regime, which was started um, in the early 2000s, ramped up in around 2013, still exists to a certain extent. There are people currently held on Pacific Islands by Australia or having been sent there by Australia um, and who have been there for you know, six, seven years now. Um, but that is what this provision is explicitly based on. And indeed the Home Office and the Home Secretary have repeatedly briefed the press over the last few um, months in particular, that they are looking to set up offshore camps and that this is going to be a deterrent to people coming here to claim asylum. Now, of course, it isn't a deterrent. 
Um, for something to truly be a deterrent, it has to be worse than what people are fleeing. Um, and uh, even in Australia's experience, if you actually speak to the academics and the experts and the lawyers that worked in that system, it wasn't offshore detention that stopped people coming to Australia. People kept coming. In fact, in the year after offshore detention was set up, more people arrived for, to claim asylum in Australia than at any time in Australia's history. Um, it was illegal pushbacks um, that the Australian government um, undertook. So. It's not going to uh, work as a deterrent, but I but I think it's incredibly um, I think it's incredibly important to see this as a realistic option. Um, but as I say, the Home Office is heavily briefed on this. It's unlikely that much in the bill is going to do anything to actively deter people crossing the channel in small boats. And I think that politically, um, when people are still arriving next year. Um, and as the months go on, they'll be looking for further distraction techniques. And I could well see the Home Office eventually persuading some country somewhere to set up one of these camps. And that is um, really sort of quite disturbing. And it's it does it's really important for, I think, um, for us as a group to recognise that this is something that's so different from the... The reason I introduced the report was think we were trying to then think about how to make the system that we have work slightly better and look for real collaborative ways of reform. But this proposal, uh, it's hard to know where we would be able to start in terms of trying to make that system fair, accessible uh, and workable. And the, you've given some fairly headline important reasons as to why that would be um, uh, I, I just we wouldn't be able to sort of talk about real access to justice or or engaging in human rights principles in relation to the determination of, of such processes. So I think it's um, important for us to recognise maybe we'll go and uh, move on to another issue, not to say that isn't important, but just what it feeds into, to my mind, and I will come back to that other point, Adrian, that you wanted to talk about in the context of decision making, but about access to legal advice. If people were offshore, I mean, people who were in the UK have significant barriers to accessing legal advice and appropriate legal advice at the right times. So, and I was going to come to Alison and to, to Jarway to talk about that, but I just wanted to think about the idea that if we have those difficulties, um, even in the context of a regulated legal aid system that we have in the UK, and then when that system doesn't work so well, uh, access to judicial reviews of the av availability of um, advice, for example, for persons in detention, and you might come back to you, Bella, to talk about that, how, how that's even going to work in an outsourced offshore system. Um, but, I, 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 Bella, I'll just come back to you on that point, um, and then I'll come to Alison and then to Jarwade. Thanks, Sonali. And I think, you know, the central problem with this provision, well, one of the many problems with this provision is we don't know which country, we don't know whether this country has a legal system um, that is functioning, an asylum system that is functioning, any sort of rights protection. It is entirely unknown. So the idea that MPs are today or tomorrow being asked to vote in favour of sending asylum seekers to God knows where to face God knows what conditions um, and God knows what um, possibility of access to justice is just pretty staggering. Um, it really is a blank check power and a deeply enabling power. Um, and as I say, it, it applies to everybody, including those groups that we know are highly vulnerable and will find it very difficult to access legal advice, as you say, Sonali, even in um, the UK at the moment in detention or outside of detention. So that includes children, um, sexual violence and torture survivors, modern slavery survivors, um, people with learning disabilities. Um, it is entirely comprehensive. No one is excluded um, because then it wouldn't act as the deterrent that it is meant to be. Um, so I think in this sort of scenario, you know, the concept of access to justice is kind of, you know, fantastical. It's, it's not real um, in, in any way. Um, and it is fundamentally the UK completely outsourcing um, any obligations under the Refugee Convention. Thank you. Thanks, very important. Um, um, Jarwid, perhaps I'll come to you first on relation to barriers to legal advice as there are, as exist in the UK, um, let alone dealing with the outsourcing position. Uh, honestly, I don't know what the problem is. Everyone seems perfectly happy. It's a wonderful system. 
I mean, I think that uh, I'm with the classicists, uh, Summum Eus Summa Inuria, um, and that's there for Sh Sue Shutter, who's in the audience, who will get that. More law, less justice. And the problem is you've got 83 sections and seven schedules, which are designed like a sledgehammer to knock the crap out of applications. Just tying a couple of things together from, from the earlier contributions, one I was just thinking of as we were talking is this idea that um, there are so many barriers put on being able to make an application for asylum from within the UK, either because you're on a boat and it's, uh, you know, you're, you're thrown off a dinghy on your way to the UK or you are sent somewhere else. There's also the visa penalty clause, which, uh, you know, it's a minor thing, but it's a visa penalty clause that can be imposed on non-cooperative uh, states. And one can bet that the refugee producing countries are going to be on that list, which means that it's another way of preventing access to the UK. So all of these measures sort of coming together start from this principle of bad faith, because there are several references within the bill to the idea of you need to show good faith and anyone that's not showing good faith. So the presumption always is anyone that's applying for asylum isn't using good faith. There is bad faith throughout, which is why so much is required. And as you pointed out at the beginning, um, in terms of numbers, they're not going up. It's simply the inefficiencies within the Home Office that are allowing the perception of those numbers because the throughput of decision making has really slowed down. So I'll, I'll get off my rant box now if I possibly can, uh, although I imagine that most of us are pretty uh, sort of startled about all of these things. But in, in terms of other barriers, within the availability of legal aid for immigration, the number of firms that are able to offer and do offer legal aid is declining. There are vast areas of the UK in which it is impossible to find a lawyer able to undertake immigration on a, a legal aid basis. Uh, and the idea of us having offshore offices in the Ascension Islands or wherever it may be is simply fanciful. So the advice does it's already exist, let alone the idea of um, transposing them elsewhere. In terms of sustainability of firms, there's a very uh, uh, powerful piece of work by uh, Dr. Joe Wilding, another garden, from the Garden Court stable, uh, who has sort of identified real problems and real world problems in terms of the availability of representation uh, more generally. But there's also a difference between the theoretical availability of uh, suppliers, uh, firms, and the actual willingness and ability of those firms to undertake those cases. Very few of us uh, make a good living on just legal aid immigration. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there is a real misconception about the gravy train that exists. Uh, I d I, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty thin broth. It's pretty thin broth is what I would say. But uh, rant over. I think Alison is going to also talk about this subject. Thanks very much, Jawed. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I obviously echo what, much of what Jawed has said, and I think that the, the question of sustainability is an absolutely critical one. And this is a, 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 and another one of Joe Wilding's excellent reports, a recent one she published about London and the gap between what well, people generally think of London as somewhere where there is a lot of um, provision. And it's true is that a significant proportion of the providers are in London, but the gap between supply and demand is massive. Um, and some of that is due to sustainability and recruitment and retention problems as a result of the impossibility of actually making ends meet when you're working on legal aid rates. And sort of cash flow problems that have been exacerbated during, um, during the pandemic. So the suspension of decision making by the Home Office um, for a long period during the pandemic meant that providers were effectively unable to be paid for work they'd done on cases. Some measures were brought in by the LAA last year to mitigate that, but they didn't fully address the problem. Um, so th there's a real sustainability problem. So we've got a problem now with the shortage of suppliers and it's only going to get worse. And then you add into that all of the new kind of issues and levels of decision and stages of decision that are being introduced through this bill. And so, for example, we haven't touched on one of the big issues, this sort of 
um, division of refugees into two groups. Um, those who are brought here legally and those who manage to overcome all the barriers that everyone's been talking about about coming here under your own devices, who will be given shorter periods of leave and have to apply to renew that leave more often and therefore need legal advice more often. And therefore there's going to be an increase in demand um, at the same time as you're seeing the sustainability and the implications of long-term underfunding really threatening the, the viability of the sector as it is. So, and then I come back to the point I was making earlier as well about the problem with the flawed assumption about um, late claims and the reason why people don't make uh, put forward everything right at the beginning and the importance of access to good quality advice at every stage of the process um, and including when people are in detention or quasi detention, they need to be able to access good quality um, advice. And I don't know if Bella wants to come in on that topic. <laughs> Yes, I'm aware of, the, of a piece of litigation you're involved at the moment, Bella. If, if you do want to talk about it or if it's not appropriate, then do let us know, but in general terms. Thanks, Alison, and thanks, Sonali. My organisation, Detention Action, um, represented by Public Law Project, we're in the High Court today and again tomorrow, bringing a challenge to the operation of the detained duty advice scheme in, um, in IRCs. And this is based on three years of monitoring since the new um, contracts were tendered in uh, the autumn of 2018, and also evidence that have been that's been gathered from um, other legal aid providers and from the LAA's own management information, which demonstrates pretty comprehensively that um, there is just an absolute dearth of of, of proper, timely, um, good quality advice going on in detention. Some firms. Um, actually not opening immigration cases, um, people frequently, you know, being made to wait far too long to get that, to get that advice. Um, so there's already a huge problem with legal advice in detention and so much that's in this bill is going to exacerbate that, whether it's um, the, uh, the new detained fast track system, demanding that people put in their appeal within five days of receiving um, an adverse decision, um, you know, and as uh, and as Al Al Alison says, there are um, the complications and the additional sort of bureaucracy um, that's inherent in this new admiss inadmissibility scheme just means that there's going to be even more pressure and even more um, demand on a sector that just seems to be um, shrinking and unable to sustain itself. It's notable, I think, that um, the, LA, the LAA recently tendered for the new IRC in Derwent side um, and then actually had to just collapse that exercise because they didn't have enough firms that were able to meet the minimum requirements for the rota to be established. Well, that's really concerning, obviously, and, uh, and it does really then sort of echo the point that Jarwade was making uh, about how whether it's actually financially viable for firms just to do le immigration legal aid. Um, I mean, one of the other things that um, I wanted to just observe, perhaps in this context, was which goes on to talk about the sort of misconception about immigration and asylum lawyers. I don't know if anyone had any particular observations about that, not just about in terms of funds or funding, but in terms of just a bit more of the what we've seen, uh, which I would suggest is a, a sort of climate of hostility, perhaps towards certain areas of the of our profession. John. I think that's I think that's absolutely the case, Sonali, and it's something that is clearly quite a deliberate strategy of this government that they have as one of their main talking points. And I see this in not just the public speeches, but in the press releases that get sent to journalists and often passed on to us. One of the top talking points is talking down the lawyers, attacking the lawyers, comparing lawyers to people smugglers, um, and really whipping up a huge amount of hate and hostility. I know a lot of um, NGOs that work in this sector, including ours, have had to take new security measures to try and protect ourselves, whether it's panic alarms or um, you know, new systems for ensuring that our doors are locked all, at all times, hiding our, um, hiding our physical addresses um, because of the hostility and the hatred that the government is intentionally whipping up against us. Um, and I think that is a huge problem. I mean, talk about acting in bad faith and acting incredibly irresponsibly. Um, there is absolutely no excuse for it. And uh, given 
very public recent uh, direct attacks on immigration lawyers, you know, the government is on notice that this is having an impact, um, and yet it continues. Thank you, Stella. I, th I think it's also fair to say that there is an element of even handedness in this, though, because the government take the view that claimants don't need lawyers in the same way that the government has legal advice, but tends to ignore it. So, again, there, there is no inconsistency here. Thank you for that observation, Jared. I just wanted to move to talk a bit more about the accelerated appeals procedure, um, uh, to perhaps to describe what it is and then back to what's the impact of that act in li limited or limitation on access to legal advice. Um, I don't know who, if anyone wants, who wants to talk, pick up the point about accelerated appeals procedures. Um, there's a few different, um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of different bits of acceleration. There's the, the reintroduction of the detained fast track, um, which of course we had a detained fast track. The government was taken to court and the court found the detained fast track was unlawful because it led to systemic unfairness in the dealing of people uh, in, in the processing of people's asylum appeals uh, because the timescales were too fast. Uh, the Home Office then tried to persuade the Tribunal Procedures Committee to reintroduce a detained fast track on I think two occasions, um, was persuaded, was unable to persuade the Tribunal Procedures Committee to do this because they simply took the view that you could not put in adequate safeguards to ensure that the system would operate fairly for people. And then, so having failed to persuade the Independent Tribunal Procedures Committee that this was an appropriate thing to do, the, uh, we now see this in the bill, and this is now the Home Office through the bill, um, seeking to force the Tribunal Procedures Committee to introduce a new detained fast track. The other bit of accelerated appeals is um, comes up in the priority removal notices part of the bill, where we see that one people who are liable to removal can be served with this priority removal notice. This is one of the kinds of notices that I was referring to earlier where if you don't provide information or evidence within the timescale that you're given by the Home Office, you're not told how long that will be, um, that has adverse consequences for your credibility and the weight attached to the evidence. But it also, if you then raise a protection or a human rights claim after what's called the PRN cutoff date, um, you will be then shoved into a, a fast track and very short appeal procedure where your only right of appeal is to the upper tribunal you lose the right to go to the first tier tribunal with all its experience in fact finding and you go straight to a tribunal that's uh, used to deciding issues of law and you have a single appeal there which is to be decided on an expedited basis and again we see the, the bill requiring the procedures committee to make provision for that and then no one would write an appeal to the court of appeal so those are just two examples um, of, of attempts to accelerate appeals processes in a way that will lead to unfairness. Thank you. And I mean, I'm not going to um, to labour the point that we've already discussed about the difficulty of accessing legal advice, but um, just in terms of remedy, I mean, perhaps we don't necessarily want to talk uh, too much about what the legal strategies might be for challenging those provisions in practice and their compatibility with the ECHR and at right to an effective remedy and um, the procedural obligations that may exist within the uh, within the ECHR, for example, or even at common law. So, uh, but do, do you see it just in the broadest terms that those provisions may be um, justiciable or challengeable? Perhaps Alison again, and I'll come to Adrian then. Oh, Adrian, perhaps. Um, I, well, I, I was just going to add that I think that if you just building on what Alison said, actually, um, on on these this, these appeals which begin in the upper tribunal and can't be promoted onwards, that they create various access to justice problems in the sense that you can't um, if you have if you don't have any review. First of all, you can't correct error. Second, in, in by way of appeal. Secondly, you can't create um, you if there are conflicting authorities from the upper tribunal. There's no way of reconciling them by binding. Uh, judgment from above and then if you need to depart from established authority um, in, in, in that level there's no way of getting it up to a level where, where, where you can do so and I think all it really does 
is it promotes judicial review um, of the upper tribunal's decision, which of course wouldn't be excluded by anything under the judicial review and courts uh, bill when it becomes legislation. And so we end up in the ironic position that pre the Asylum and Immigration Appeals Act of 1993, when refugee convention refusals were the subject of judicial review, if you go back to the old immigration appeal reports, you can see refugee convention decisions being determined there. You end up back with immigration decisions being punted back into the high court. Now, the whole direction of travel with transferring judicial reviews out of the high court has been to put them into the upper tribunal. It would be a sort of supreme legislative irony if, if the priority removal notice regime sends them back there effectively, because anyone who has a good error of law will bring a judicial review. Um, and uh, and that's the place to do it. And so back we go. So, so I think I think it's a mistake because it, it doesn't even work really on its own terms, if you see it. And uh, it's more a question of displacement rather than finality. Yeah, I think that's really, uh, really important. And just while we're talking on judicial reviews and removals of certain um, uh, certain avenues of that, I just thought perhaps I'll just pick up the point about cart judicial review now. You've sort of touched on it there, um, Adrian, but um, do you want to talk about, uh, or, or, or Jarway, do you want to talk about, about the impact of the removal of CART judicial review? Is that something that's within the uh, JR and Courts Bill, um, Judicial Review and Courts Bill, but that's sort of in tandem with where we are now in the Nationality and Borders Bill? I'm happy to pick that up. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah, so obviously at the same time that the Nationality and Borders Bill is going through Parliament, we also have the Judicial Review and Courts Bill, which um, is rather a long bill with only two clauses dealing with judicial review, one of which um, seeks to abolish the cart uh, or, or severely restrict the cart jurisdiction of the, upper, of the High Court to review decisions of the Upper Tribunal refusing permission to appeal from the First Year Tribunal. Um, what I think is striking in the context of what Adrian was just saying is it seems to be part of a wider pattern of, of creating this kind of um, insulated system in the tribunal where only the tribunal is the ultimate arbiter of everything and there's no access to the ordinary court system. That's one thing. I think the other thing I would say is that the, on the Judicial Review and Courts but the government just hasn't made its case for abolishing it. The, the statistics it relied on originally were shown to be seriously flawed. Um, and actually the, the amount of money and the number of cases is actually pretty tiny in the overall scheme of things. And the cases that do succeed are cases which involve the most fundamental human rights and are an absolutely vital safeguard for ensuring that people um, aren't reformed, aren't sent back to countries where they face torture, or aren't separated permanently from their families because of an error by the tribunal. So I think it's a really um, worrying provision um, and it's part of a general pattern, as Adrian says. Jawi, did you want to add something on this um, in relation to the potential in broader impact? I think I saw that in your note. Well, I, I, I wasn't thinking it of it just in relation to that, but I was just thinking post the decision by the Supreme Court in Begum and the idea of restricting what is up for grabs within the context of a deprivation appeal. And we've seen that more recently in a case uh, called Ciceri, I think. I think that's the pronunciation of it, where the the scope of the challenge in a deprivation appeal is is much more restricted to an almost judicial review type basis. So the scope for the tribunal itself to, 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 to determine a matter is restricted uh, much more rigorously than a full merits assessment. Uh, and I just wonder whether we might actually see that sort of approach being rolled out through mission creep into other areas, which would be pretty much the end of meaningful appeals because they're then restricted to examining solely fine technical legal points rather than the overall assessment of merits and I, I think that's a potentially further worrying trend along with everything else. Thank you, thanks Jared. Just want to bring ourselves back to thinking a bit more about some particular aspects of the decision making process which we didn't touch on earlier. One I think Adrian in particular wanted to talk about which was we talked a little bit about the standard proof thank you Alison talked about that and minimal weight provisions but um, some more sort of fundamental um, denials of access to the refugee convention by narrowing the definitions 
of who is actually, so for example, a member of a particular social group. Do you want to just... I think that's quite an important consideration in terms of breadth and appl of application of the Refugee Convention. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, what, what we've had hitherto, and it's a sort of often, it's a slightly forgotten bit of the, uh, the immigration system, which I just mentioned, was that the Refugee Convention points could be uh, determined by the courts because the Refugee Convention was largely embedded in the immigration rules. And, and so, and we had section two of the Asylum and Immigration Appeals Act, which said nothing in the immigration rules was to lay down a practice. Um, that was inconsistent with the Refugee Convention. And so that was effectively a sort of sort of demi mode of in, incorporation, both procedurally and substantively, in, in, in fact, in terms of what the Refugee Convention required. By putting all of these things into definitions of the Refugee Convention, into primary legislation, um, it no longer matters to some extent um, what best, what, what the consensus is internationally in common law courts on refugee convention interpretation. Um, it no longer matters whether the UNHCR handbook um, uh, would suggest, and they obviously have a mandate to be the sort of the experts who have carriage of the convention um, uh, in terms of its interpretation and application, what they think. Um, it, it's what Parliament has said it means. And so in a dualist system, the sort of UK refugee convention, um, which is that which will be embodied in the statutory provisions of, of this act. Um, and then there's universal refugee convention, which is what everyone else thinks it means. And, and, and that's a... Um, and UK Refugee Convention narrows the aperture. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, the limits on inadmissible asylum claims, which is connected to what Bella was talking about, about offshore processing, that if a claim is inadmissible um, because it can be processed elsewhere, then you can transfer someone. There are very narrow limits internationally where that can be done. And in the when the UK was in the EU, we had the common European asylum system. You could transfer people around because there were common standards and ultimately a common supervisory court, the Court of Justice. Um, the, in the absence of that, we, we now have a statutory and admissibility regime, which is connected to the third country regime that, that Bella was um, discussing. Um, and of course, nowhere to send people because nobody wants to take anybody um, from the UK. Um, the common European system is gone because we won't apply the common standards um, and there are no multilateral treaty arrangements to replace it. Um, and then substantively, we're defining, making our own definitions of what these terms mean. And the more we depart from it substantively by prescribing in primary legislation, the less likely we are to have a compatible um, uh, uh, shared regime for determining claims with any other country. And so it leads us into a sort of state of ever greater delinquency in terms of our international law commitments being defined domestically in a way that means fewer people um, will um, uh, get protection in this country if they manage to get here. Um, and, and, um, and, 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 and because it's prescribed by parliament, it makes it much more difficult for anybody to correct it and, 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 and to keep the UK's international commitments. Thank you, Adrian. I think that's you know a, absolutely critical that people understand that sort of basic consequence of the of the, of the bill that we're dealing with um, as a result of of um, Brexit and the failure to have any kind of returns agreements or any other and the de collapse or departure or removal from the common asylum system, um, common European asylum system, I should say. Just before I turn to uh, to the panels for for further comments, I just want to remind people that we will have some time for Q and A. There's a couple of questions that have come up in the uh, already, but just to say we'll probably have about fifteen minutes um, at the end for Q and A. But before we get to Q and A, I wanted to come back and talk a bit more about <clears throat> about uh, online access and online processes. So obviously. Uh, we started talking about this when Ellen touched on it at the beginning of the of the session, which was some of the broader recommendations made by um, the working group. And we were hoping there would just be a little bit of a trial rollout. And suddenly, of course, we were plunged into a pandemic um, and into pilot schemes and uh, um, an operation of particularly by the first tier, but also by courts across all jurisdictions um, who were trying to do work with online cases and I just wanted to, to sort of understand a bit more about what lessons we think we've learned from the last 20 months or so. I understand that the Lord Chief Justice has effectively directed everybody back to court even if some of the judges certainly even if hearings are then sometimes held online where that's appropriate but I just wanted to particularly in the context of asylum determination in the first tier which is of great concern uh, as to how those things were conducted during the pandemic and how things evolved, certainly from the from, from the very early days. 
in ter- uh, for people giving evidence online with interpreters, um, what the conditions that they were giving evidence in, and how that may have affected in people's anecdotal experience, perhaps, or in their organisational experience, perhaps yours in particular, um, current new, new organisation, Alison, um, how that affected the um, the quality of the decisions that were, were that were made. I think a really important point to just pick up from what you just said, Sonali, is, is anecdotal. Um, I am, and I will share some some impressions from what the conversations I've had with colleagues over the last few weeks. And I'd be interested to hear what others have to say as well. But um, what's what kind of didn't happen as a result of that move from pilot into mass rollout of online courts is the kind of proper evaluation and data gathering that really is necessary. To, and, and I sort of think that there are advantages. So what the anecdotal experience that I'm hearing is that there are advantages to the online system. Um, and this is reflected in, in Joe Wilding's report as well, actually, in, in that communication with the first tier tribunal, you know, applications, interim applications, they're one I dealt with more efficiently. Um, you're always notified when the other party's made an application. It's easier to communicate by email with, uh, in some instances, with the Home Office and, and, um, and with the tribunal. So there are advantages, but there are also obviously, as you say, problems, particularly with um, holding substantive hearings online, with the accessibility for you know, everybody, like who is being excluded from this, from this process. We can talk about the experiences of people who are able to access it. We also need to think about the experiences of people who can't. Um, and the, the kind of loss of co-presence aspect of not being in the room with people that changes the way that people's evidence will be kind of perceived and evaluated. Um, and then in terms of kind of, it was interesting listening to Ellen's reflections on what was kind of anticipated by the working party and what was brought in, because certainly our experience, my colleague's experience at Sala Maid has been that the engagement by the Home Office has in the system, which is critical to the proper operation of the review part of the process, has declined very significantly in recent months to the extent now that it's common for them to completely fail to comply with directions. We have experience of the appellants being directed to file a bundle without even having seen the Home Office's bundle because the tribunal has kind of given up directing the Home Office to file a bundle um, and either no review decision or a very poor quality one. So we have a system that was set up with the idea of this um, really critical review stage that is kind of breaking down a bit. And I think there's a, a need for kind of that kind of analysis, evaluation, gathering of data about how it's operating in order to to understand that. And then if I can just touch briefly on on remote advice provision, again, I think there is, you know, there are benefits for some people in being able to access your advice remotely. For some people, it's better and easier to be able to phone or, or Zoom or Teams call in to your lawyer from your home. But it's really important to recognise that that's not true for everyone. And there are large groups of people for whom it's completely inappropriate. And the role of digital um, digital exclusion in this new kind of online world can't be underestimated. I just got a question actually for you, Alison. Do you think that there needs to be, when you talk about that evaluation process of the um, of the online hearing in the in the first tier, do you think that should be a formal sort of government evaluation or a HMCTS evaluation and that should that like an inquiry or a a commission, or do you think that should be done sort of in a different way potentially? There needs to be that they there needs to be access to the data, like the information about how many appeals have gone, what's happened, what's been the outcomes of appeals. So there's a need for data, um, and that needs to come from HMCTS, but also needs to come from appellants and from the Home Office. Um, whether you need an, I'm not sure about an inquiry, but some kind of evaluation of how this is, you know, how this has gone and, and kind of. Because from justice's point of view, that, that might be something that justice is in a position to um, at least discuss with the relevant participants from the original working party, for example. Mm. I mean, that's, that is one, I was just thinking that's perhaps one mechanism and one thing we could take away. From, there's not, there's maybe not a lot we can take away to, from today in in terms of sort of those actions, but that is maybe one of them. And uh, mm. I just wanted to ask you, um, Bella, just in terms of what Alison's observations on remote um, advice provision, 
so obviously in detention and in prison we've there's that's the is that realistically the the only kind of advice people are getting or they are getting face-to-face -face advice um so it's mixed um i mentioned um the new irc derwent side which is just um being set up um and i know that there because of the failure of the tendering process there will be only online provision available for the first six months of its operation um I think that in some of the um, more well-established IRCs, there are now um, legal in-person appointments being made. I mean, one thing I would say in the detention context, it is absolutely essential um, that people are given face-to-face -face, um, meetings and, 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 and consultations because people in detention are already so cut off from existing support networks, whether it's family members, friends, communities, people that might be able to assist them in understanding the process and engaging with it. Um, and I know that our case workers find um, when we go into detention and, and um, have our clinics to provide practical and emotional support and to assist people in, in terms of engaging with solicitors, um, it's so frequently those that are most marginalized and most vulnerable for a variety of reasons, whether it's language barriers, past experiences, mental capacity issues, learning disabilities, those people are not the ones that are ringing our helpline by and large. They're the ones that are in detention, often wasting away, have often been there for months and months, sometimes years, and have absolutely no idea sometimes where they are, what's going on, um, what services are available to them. And it's only by us being physically present in detention um, that they can be signposted. Often a friend might bring them along to speak to somebody. Um, and it's only by, you know, making ourselves that available and that accessible that we reach those that are, you know, often the ones most in need of, of the support. Um, so I think physical presence in IRCs is absolutely essential. Um, and in fact, we've seen a massive deterioration in terms of our clients, the culture in IRCs over the course of the pandemic in all sorts of highly, highly disturbing Way. So I think that the more that those places can be opened up um, and the more lawyers can be physically present, the better. I'm now going to pop up and say thank you again <laughs> from uh, on behalf of Justice. Thank you so much um, for all of your uh, such expertise and insight. I enjoyed that so much. So I can't believe how much content we managed to uh, cram into that short amount of time. So to our chair, Salani Nayak QC, and to our panellists, Jawed Lukmani, Alison Picker, Bella Sankey, and Adrian Berry, thank you all so much. Um, and thank you to those who are joining us uh, at home, or I hope not still in the office, but you know, from wherever you are, thank you. Um, and uh, just a reminder that obviously we uh, do the work we do because we have support from our members. So please do go online to, to, to see about membership and also to, to see what we've been up to. The uh, update report to the 2018 uh, report will be online um, in due course. And you can also see there Justice's ongoing briefing on the Nationality and Orders Bill, which we've been doing jointly with the Public Law Project. Um, but for now, thanks again, um, and I hope everyone has a very good evening. Thank you so much.